Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Professionals and Community Members as Recovery Allies. My name is Marla Kaufman, and I'm the Communication and Health Promotion Associate at IRETA. I will be moderating our webinar today. I would like to go over some quick housekeeping items about how to use the WebEx technology and how to access continuing education credits. First, we would like to encourage you all to participate in today's webinar in a few ways. If you have questions for our presenter or are experiencing any technical difficulties, please use either the chat function or the Q&A panel to communicate your questions. Our presenter, Allison Jones Webb, will take questions at the end of the webinar. Feel free to submit your questions through the chat or Q&A box at any time. This webinar is approved for one and a half PCB and or NADAC credits, which are free. A certificate of attendance will also be available to download from your My IRETA account. Please take note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs and certificate to be available in your My IRETA profile because we have to cross check your attendance with WebEx following the webinar. After the webinar, you will receive a follow up email. This email will include a link to an evaluation form for the webinar as well as more information on how to access your certificate of attendance and continuing education credits. We may send you an additional email to remind you of the evaluation. I would now like to, to introduce today's presenter. Author and public health professional Allison Jones Webb of Charlottesville, Virginia, is a passionate advocate for people in recovery from addictions. She has written extensively about issues related to recovery from addiction and harm reduction. Her book, Recovery Allies, How to Support Addiction, Recovery, and Build Recovery-Friendly Communities, lays out practical ways that communities can help support people in recovery and why this is so vitally important. Webb holds, a master's degree, holds master's degrees in public health from the University of New England and in economic history from the Johns Hopkins University. She is a certified prevention specialist, trained recovery coach, recovery ambassador with Faces and Voices of Recovery, and a member of the Virginia Recovery Advocacy Project. She was a founding member of Maine's first chapter of Young People in Recovery and served on the steering committee to develop the University of Southern Maine's Collegiate Recovery Program. She is past president of the Maine Association of Recovery Residences and an active volunteer in numerous other recovery-related efforts. Webb has more than 20 years of experience in public speaking, policy development and advocacy, data-driven decision-making, nonprofit st strategic planning, community outreach and organizing, and linking community members with healthcare. Okay, Allison, if you are ready, I will hand things over to you. Oh, let me unmute you. There, you, I just sent the request. Oh, I think you, you need to accept the request. There you go. Okay, thanks Marla and thanks for that um, introduction. I am so thrilled to be speaking in front of IRETA members uh, today. It's an audience that's important to me uh, as an ally uh, to talk with you about how you can be allies in addition to uh, the clinical work that you do. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about myself so you know who's talking to you. Um, I do have um, about 20 years of experience in public health in the state of Maine. Um, and much of that time I spent uh, addressing substance use issues. And so my work sort of followed the data. Uh, if you know anything about public health, we're always looking at data and public health. And so initially some 20 years ago, the data really pointed to uh, increases in youth substance use. Uh, and so I worked with community coalitions to uh, on prevention initiatives, preventing alcohol use, tobacco use, and then cannabis use later on. And as the data on opioid overdose deaths started to come in for the state of Maine, uh, we were uh, scrambling to figure out what to do in the public health community. And so I shifted my work to um, educating community members about uh, opioids, educating uh, them about opioid overdose deaths, but more importantly, working with uh, clinicians and working with healthcare providers so that they understood what the data were telling us, that people were overdosing from predominantly uh, prescription drugs, and we had to we had some work to do around that. 
Um, at that time, you know, the clinicians were really used to dealing with um, alcohol use disorder, people coming in uh, with problems with alcohol. And so they uh, were unfamiliar with the medications for opioid use disorder. And, um, you know, had, we had a lot of learning to do together as a community. And so I also, once we uh, sort of did that piece of education and started to uh, increase access to um, sub suboxone, buprenorphine and methadone, um, I worked uh, to develop pathways so individuals who were seeking treatment could get treatment. Uh, and that, of course, is an imperfect, um, imperfect project all the time, uh, but we continue to work on that. Uh, so getting more doctors to prescribe or more healthcare providers to describe, prescribe, uh, educating the population, including uh, family members about that as a, as a legitimate uh, treatment, and then also uh, just finding pathways. How do people access this treatment? And then um, again, you know, looking at the data, so the overdose deaths continued to rise, and uh, I started to, to do some work in harm reduction. One of the things I did that was particularly interesting was um, interviewing and doing focus groups with individuals who are currently using drugs to understand what their needs were, to understand where they accessed care, uh, to understand uh, what a good, uh, what they needed, what we could do to help keep them alive, uh, and to, uh, and in addition to sort of standard uh, needle exchange services. And then the last piece, uh, sort of we're, we're moving forward now, we're in about, uh, I don't know, 2014, maybe 2015, I started working on recovery support services. And so as some of, in, some of the individuals in Maine entered recovery, we realized that there was very little to support them. And so, um, we developed um, a network of recovery residences, a network of recovery community centers, uh, and we continued again to educate the public about recovery, that recovery is not only possible, but probable. So, um, so that's sort of me. And I wanna just tell you also why I was inspired to write the book. And so as part of that work, we did, um, community forums, community meetings. We went out to small towns in church basements and uh, large towns in school uh, gymnasiums, anywhere we could go where we could talk about recovery. And we took individuals, young people in recovery, who were so super excited about their own recovery, very much on fire about it and very much willing to talk about it. Uh, so they would tell their story of recovery we would connect that with an individual from the community, usually a healthcare provider who could talk about the science behind addiction and recovery. And then we would open it up for questions. And there was always, always at least one question uh, from someone who would say, this is so important. We know it's a problem in our community. What can we do to help? And so I thought, well, I'll just go look and see what the resources are for people who wanna help. And there was very little. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, somebody should write a book about that. And then I thought, you know, maybe I should write a book about that. So I spent the next two years uh, during COVID actually uh, writing this book. So um, I'm gonna jump into the content now um, of the presentation. Hmm. So um, I'm gonna talk about allies, who's an ally? Um, can professionals be allies? Um, and um, any helping professional, but in particular addiction treatment professionals. Why are allies important in the ecosystem? What is recovery capital and how can allies help build recovery capital? And then how can we all engage recovery allies and helping them find out what they can do? So by the end of the presentation, um, I need to, excuse me for just a sec. By the end of the presentation, you'll be able to talk about um, recovery capital, personal, social, and community. You'll be able to identify three strategies to engage allies and increase recovery capital. And you'll be able to apply three st strategies uh, within your own work uh, to help support uh, build recovery capital within the ecosystem, such as supporting social networks, um, education, employment opportunities, and access to healthcare. Now, I'm telling you these things. We're going to talk about recovery capital, for example. I'm certain that most of you know what recovery capital is. And I'm telling you this and giving you a way to talk about it because in the community, most people don't know what it is. And it's a concept that once people 
understand it, they get it, they understand how they can um, help out uh, in their community, how they can support individuals and the recovery community overall. But as professionals, you have this knowledge and you have the ability to educate people about it and what they can do with it. So what is a recovery ally? So there is no definition of the of a ally, of recovery ally in any of the academic literature. Um, I um, have dug up a couple of my own, uh, just in terms of in talking with people. Uh, this one I like a lot. So Tom Banner is the program coordinator at the VCU uh, Rams and Recovery Program. It's a very active collegiate recovery program. It serves as the hub for the other collegiate recovery programs in Virginia. And Tom says, being an ally is about being continually willing to grow and to learn about people's experiences. Allyship is really personalized and individualized. And what I like about this is that the emphasis is on the, the qualities of the ally as an individual being willing to learn and being open to other people's experiences. And so an ally doesn't come in with the answers. An ally comes in wanting to learn more and wanting to be supportive. And so it's different for every individual. Uh, Tom has a training. Uh, this is actually a, a recovery ally training for mostly for collegiate recovery programs in Virginia. It's available for free. It's very good. Um, and so if you have an interest uh, in doing a training in your community, there are others online also, but this one is particularly good. Uh, you could use this or use parts of it um, to sort of engage potential allies and to educate existing allies on addiction and recovery. So this is my definition. Um, a recovery ally is someone who uses their resources and connections to support people in recovery and to support the recovery community. So this really talks more about what the ally can do. So if you have resources, you have connections, uh, one person said, yeah, if you have connections to power, those are things that you can use uh, within your own community so to support people in recovery. We'll talk more about that. So can addiction professionals be allies? And the answer is yes, but, uh, or yes, and there are hurdles. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of them, but I think probably you will be able to come up with some on your own if you've had experiences of trying to be an ally in the community or within your own profession and come up against some, uh, some challenges. So the first issue really is access to treatment. So it doesn't have to do with you as an individual. It has to do with our healthcare system and our addiction treatment system that some people just don't have access. And so that access could be uh, location of facilities. It could be uh, payment for the treatment that they need, for the services that they need. Um, it could also be just uh, ignorance about what's out there in terms of the right kind of treatment at the right time. And so um, there are advocacy opportunities for, for professionals around this access issue to how to help uh, increase access for people in recovery to access your services. Another hurdle um, is philosophy, your philosophy as a treatment provider or a clinician and your approach. And so um, I have a couple of ideas about that, but you again can can think among, think, talk among yourselves, think about uh, some of your uh, um, differences in philosophy and approach that you've come up with, come up to your approach versus someone in recovery or the recovered community. So for example, uh, you know, there's a, there's um, a debate uh, about uh, should people take medication if they are in recovery? And uh, the science is very clear that medication assisted uh, treatment for either addiction, for opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, absolutely those are effective treatments and they work. Uh, but in the recovery community, there is resistance to that because it is not uh, considered abstinence. And you may hold that view yourself or that may be um, a, a position that's in the profession as well. And so there's tension around that, uh, that could be a hurdle if you have a different philosophy in your, either your agency or yourself and individuals that you're working with. Similarly for medication for mental health uh, issues, uh, some people in the recovery community really feel like uh, abstinence is abstinence is abstinence. And so any medications are really not 
uh, don't allow you to um, experience true recovery. And, uh, you know, some people believe that the, the reason you have problems is because you're using drugs or alcohol. And once you stop that, your problems will go away. And so, again, a philosophy and an approach that may be in conflict with, um, with your own work. Um, another hurdle uh, is the importance of peers. And so uh, this isn't necessarily a conflict, but it could be. So in the recovery community, it's very clear. Uh, people tell me all the time, you know, the treatment professionals were really important to me, but they were, but the, but the peers, my peers, other people in recovery were the most helpful people to me. And, um, and so uh, there's research around peers, there's training for peers, uh, and there's a place for peers. Some treatment agencies have peers, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, professional treatment is not important as well. And so again, you know, there may be a perception, moving on to the next one, there may be a perception that treatment doesn't work and of course we know that um, the right treatment at the right time with the proper supports will help an individual um, seek and maintain recovery but the perception because people in the general community don't necessarily know what treatment what is the right time uh, what is treatment uh, the perception is that it doesn't work and so uh, you combine that with the importance of peers people in recovery just being very clear about the importance of peers and that can be a hurdle for addiction allies serving as um, as allies. And in the other category, you know, the one thing that came up for me, and again, this is something that you could think about, but um, the issue of both personal and professional ethics. And so I don't know what the professional ethics are in your prof profession for being an advocate outside of advocating for your individual patients, if you can be out in the community advocating, um, if you can be out in the community educating, I don't know that. Uh, what are the boundaries uh, between what you're able to do as a treatment provider and what you're able to do in other parts of your life? And similarly, what are your personal boundaries? I, I do know that some people are, are not comfortable uh, being a recovery ally, um, except in the one-on-one -on -one uh, realm or accept as a family member, other people are comfortable being completely out and about and doing uh, advocacy work. So that's, those are some challenges that um, I've identified. So let's talk about the recovery ecosystem, because this is where we all find ourselves. Um, there are a few uh, ways that we look at the ecosystem. I'm going to just show you a couple. There's a lot of research um, online. One of the, sorry, a lot of research being done. One of the um, uh, approaches is to look at the recovery ecosystem as a set of services that are available to individuals in or seeking recovery. And so that would look at uh, treatment services, um, uh, harm reduction services, family support services. And so this uh, map, um, you can click on it. You can find out what's available in your county. It's all that data collected by county where it is available. And then there are overlays. You can sort of take a look at um, overdose mortality, which may be important if your issue is opioids. It may not be so important if you're really looking at alcohol as a problem in your community. Um, it overlays socio de socioeconomic demographics. So how old is your population? Are they wealthy? Are they less wealthy? And so this gives you a, a way of looking at, again, your county um, to see where there might be gaps in services and where you might be able to fit in as an ally. It also is something that speaks to people in recovery because it is service oriented. Um, another way of looking at the uh, recovery ecosystem is really more as a continuum of care. Um, and so uh, thinking about an individual who enters um, treatment, so maybe they come through behavioral health, they come through the community, they come through the emergency department, they enter treatment, and so then this is sort of the, um, the continuum of care, they go through treatment, they go through bridge program, which basically means, and this is usually focusing on medications for opioid use disorder, they go through a bridge program where they continue to get their medications uh, and treatment while they're being transitioned to a healthcare provider who's in primary care who provides them with their medications and they continue to receive mental health services. 
So this is really more, in my opinion, this is really much more uh, healthcare uh, system focused. And then uh, this is the way I like to think about uh, the recovery ecosystem. So I like to put the individual in recovery in the center of it all. Uh, and then as, as that person um, engages with other people in their circle, uh, their, their, the circle that's closest to them, their parents, their children, siblings, spouses, partners, their close friends, those um, individuals uh, represent sort of one uh, set of allies in the recovery ecosystem. Parents and children and so forth have a big role to play. We all know that. As we go further out, this is a, a concentric circle that's a little bit further away from the person in recovery, grandparents, extended family, co-workers, neighbors, uh, a broader social network, but still people where there's an individual connection uh, and where those people, co-workers, neighbors, your faith community can all have a role to play in the individual's recovery. The next uh, concentric circle out is people who are maybe less, inter maybe less connected personally with the individual in recovery, but who nonetheless have a pretty significant impact on the way that their recovery can look. And so that would be landlords. Uh, we know that uh, some landlords um, absolutely discriminate against individuals who are in recovery, and there's a lot of work to be done around that, a lot of education. But landlords can be allies if they know, if they know more uh, and they know how they can be supportive. Same, same thing for employers uh, with their employment strategies, or sorry, the empl employment policies um, and the support that they provide for their employees on site. Um, financial institutions, you know, I do know some uh, financial institutions that are willing to work with individuals in recovery to basically uh, combine their debt and uh, find a way to pay that back and also to do education, financial education. Counselors and healthcare providers, uh, social service providers, I think that's you. Uh, you do have direct contact with individuals, but you also are a link to other parts of the ecosystem in terms of. Um, being able to link people to other services. And then I'll go through the others quickly, teachers, librarians, law enforcement officers, faith, uh, heal, faith, mm, faith leaders, and harm reduction. These are all, uh, they may be individuals that the person in recovery interacts with, maybe not, but they are very important in the ecosystem in terms of how they uh, support a person who's seeking housing, seeking counseling, seeking education, looking for information, and so forth. Um, next to last, further out, um, are business owners, uh, and in this regard, not as employers, but as business owners in the community, local decision makers like um, the mayor, city council, researchers, college and universities, recovery high schools, public housing, drug court, family court, and so forth. So those are places where the individual may receive services or not. But the fact that they are there and provide some support for the recovery community is very important. And then last, but certainly not least, are state and federal decision makers and public funders and private foundations. Now, these things are the furthest away from that individual in recovery. And yet, they may have the potential to have the greatest impact. So if you think about federal and state policies, uh, and how those have a direct impact on people in recovery, negative or positive. Same thing with public funders, with grant money or other types of funding, and same thing with private foundations. There's a huge amount of influence there that individuals in recovery may have may never know about. Um, and so this this is basically our recovery ecosystem the way I think about it. And this is just uh, this is a list of those. Uh, those rungs uh, in case it's difficult to see the graphic. So, as we're in the recovery ecosystem, we find ourselves there. Where are we? Uh, so, I myself am a family member, um, and somewhere in there, there must be public health, but I'm a family member. And um, I'm both, uh, both as a sibling, as an aunt, as a grandchild. Uh, and so, I have a lot of different hats to play. I um, am located in different places in the ecosystem and depending on where I am, I have a different role. And so we as professionals or you as professionals can, can really amplify that impact 
when you create opportunities for them to move within the ecosystem. And so if somebody gives me an opportunity, for example, to speak uh, to a group of employers, uh, that moves me out of being a family member or being a public health professional into the employer uh, part of the ecosystem. So as treatment providers, as professionals, that, that is one of the things that you're able to do. And then if we put all this together, all these individuals in recovery who have all of these different circles around them of people who are potential allies, uh, who provide services, who provide support, who provide access to power. This is what our ecosystem looks like. And so you can see that for any one individual, they're definitely overlapping uh, allies. Uh, so if we, if we put it all together, if we do our work, we have a tremendous ability to have an impact on the lives of those individuals in recovery. So switching gears. Um, I'm going to talk about recovery capital and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm pretty sure that y'all know about it, maybe know more about it than I do. Um, there's a lot of research that's been going on it, a lot of new research. Uh, so the field is changing. Um, but what's important here is that individuals that we interact with understand recovery capital. And so sometimes it's helpful. Uh, I've had, I found it helpful to talk, depending on who I'm talking to, to talk about social capital. There are a lot of people who understand that without thinking about recovery capital. Sometimes I talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, and what people need uh, as they are getting better uh, in their recovery uh, as again, as another way for people to access that information. So recovery capital is the total of resources that a person can bring to bear on the initiation and maintenance of substance use, misuse, cessation. That's a quote, I would never say it that way. Um, but basically it's all that a person has within themselves and externally that helps them get well and stay well. So um, these, I think, you know, I'm going to go through them because then when we get uh, later on, when we talk about what can allies do, allies can help increase recovery capital. So if they know that personal recovery capital, for example, is, includes basic needs, housing, food, transportation, includes health care, mental and physical health care and health. It includes employment. Employment is a major piece of personal recovery capital, similarly for education. It includes some of those softer skills, problem solving, financial management, interpersonal skills, self-esteem. And then it also includes a person's belief system, like who are they in the universe and how do they think about themselves? And those things all kind of contribute to either the absence of them or the presence of them contributes to the amount of recovery capital a person has. Social recovery capital is all about relationships uh, with family and friends, with peers, uh, with support uh, from a partner or a spouse. Re research shows that partners and spouses are particularly important, either positive or negative, and, and having um, access to one's children if you've lost custody, but if you still are able to visit them, if you still have some hope of regaining custody, very, very important. Um, and then recovery related social events, there are rallies and uh, educational ses sessions and so forth that create an opportunity for social interaction and create a sense of community. And then community recovery capital is really more what's available in the community to support recovery. So treatment, all types of treatment. Um, all types of recovery support services. So that would be 12-step uh, meetings, recovery housing, peer recovery centers, harm reduction services, uh, diversion programs, uh, so people don't end up going to jail or prison. Um, organizations that ser serve the compute, compute, whew, compute community generally, where they're creating a sense of community for not just themselves, but for individuals in recovery as well. And I include faith organizations there. Um, and then our attitudes, our attitudes in the community that can make or break a person's interest in being involved uh, and uh, being a part of, of being a positive part of the community. Same thing with trust and having a common goal, living in a community together. 
And then advocacy, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in talking about advocacy, but advocacy turns out to be really important for many individuals in recovery uh, when they uh, when they sort of learn what advocacy opportunities are available. And I'm here talking about not so much personal advocacy, but advocacy in the uh, policy realm. That varies from community to community, state to state. It's pretty much the same for all of us at the federal level. Um, and that is all, you know, if an individual has access to that part of recovery capital. And in addition to being able to increase recovery capital, there are high risk times for recovery capital de de depreciation. So individuals may be aware of this, family members may not. So when a person leaves incarceration or leaves treatment, they are at high risk, very high risk for starting to use again. And because of the uh, way that opioids work in the body, they're at high risk for overdose. Um, and so when any of that happens, when they start using again, uh, particularly when there's an overdose, uh, their recovery capital sort of disintegrates. Same thing can happen in a stressful situation where a person is working hard, things are going pretty well, but there's, uh, there's a problem at work or you lose a job, that recovery capital is really at risk of disintegrating. And similarly, relationships, as I mentioned, spouses, uh, partners, and also children, that those, uh, when those relationships are at risk, the person is at risk for uh, losing a lot of recovery capital and needs some extra support. So let's talk about allies and what they can do. So how do people get better? Um, I like this quote. Uh, this is from Dr. David Best. He's a leading researcher in uh, recovery support services and recovery generally. He says that based on research, this is like the best way to explain to people who don't have any, you know, knowledge of the research or what have you. How do people get better? They change their social networks and they engage in meaningful activities. That's it. That is what the research shows us. So you don't have to read tomes of research and you don't have to describe to people in a researchy way what they can do to help individuals in recovery. They can help change their social networks and they can help them engage in meaningful activities. So now let's talk about some actions for allies. Um, so in that context of what can allies do and how do people get better, Something that's really important uh, is for allies to learn about addiction and recovery. We'll talk more about that. Allies have a critical role in fighting discrimination, prejudice, and stigma. Allies need to know where resources are, talk about that. And then talk more uh, in detail about how people can find their place in that recovery ecosystem, figure out where they have some influence, and then figure out what their action is to take. So, Learning about addiction and recovery. Now, I know I'm uh, speaking to a bunch of people who know more about addiction than I do, uh, but I will add uh, that I continue to learn about addiction and recovery because the research is changing almost daily. And so we are learning so much, particularly about recovery, but also about different modes of treatment and different medications. Um, we need to keep up on that. We need to keep a pace with that as professionals, and we need to be able to um, convey that to community members. We need to be able to appreciate the different definitions of recovery. And uh, you notice that I haven't included the definition of recovery. Usually I use SAMHSA's definition, um, but I find that people have all different ways of thinking about their own recovery, uh, that they can explain much better than I can, and that that has a much stronger influence on individuals in the recovery, in the re community, learning about recovery, different definitions, and different pathways. Uh, so for people in the community who have just not been following the issue, basically they think that people have to go to a 12 step meeting and that's, and then they're in recovery. They go and then they're in recovery. So we just have a lot of education to do about how people get to recovery and how people stay healthy. And then I always point people to this website, the Recovery Research Institute based out of Mass General and Harvard uh, is a group of researchers who, um, who provide recovery research uh, online and up to date. And uh, if you go to the website, you, you'll find that they um, annotate articles. And so there's information about, you know, for what does this article tell us for professionals? for the individual in recovery, for family members, 
for policymakers. And so it's a really good place to go. It's neutral uh, and it provides evidence-based answers and where there isn't an answer, it will, or there isn't uh, research to back up an answer, it will say that. So allies fight discrimination, prejudice, and stigma. So this, um, it might surprise you, but in my view, fighting uh, stigma, discrimination, and pre prejudice starts here with us, it starts at home. And so allies, cons we consider our own, own experiences with drug and alcohol use, and we have a willingness to change our attitudes when we get new information. And so I know that in my life, um, I ha have been um, impacted pretty significantly by alcohol and drugs. Um, I am the daughter of a child of an alcohol of an alcoholic. Uh, that's, I'm not sure we say it that way anymore. Um, and I have uh, people who are using substances in my orbit. And I came through college in the 70s and 80s. Drug use was really different then. That influences the way that I think about drugs. Uh, you will find that people use drugs differently now uh, than they did back in the day. Um, and so I need to consider all of those things about my own experience to understand better what people in recovery are going through today. And I need to be able to change what I think when I get some new information, when somebody tells me, oh, guess what? It turns out, you know, if you call somebody an alcoholic or you call somebody an addict, it really doesn't help them get better, for example. So um, <clears throat> allies also learn how to be, uh, they learn how they need to change to be more empathetic and accepting. And again, in my experience, when people are able to talk with individuals in recovery uh, and um, have an opportunity to engage, it increases their understanding and their empathy. Now, there are also people who have been dealing with a population of people who have addictions for a long time and who get to be a little bit cynical. And that is um, particularly, uh, it is the responsibility of us to help those folks who are pretty jaded um, about what works and what doesn't, and treatment doesn't work, and I'm so sick of it, you know, I can't, can't this guy just won't get better. Uh, it's up to us to kind of help change the conversation around that. And we, as allies, we figure out how we can speak up. So there's all kinds of situations where uh, poor terminology is used, uh, degrading comments are used about people who use drugs, but also people who used to use drugs who are now in recovery. And so those uh, those statements, you know, things like yeah, he's he's just a he's just a junkie, you know, finding out a way, whatever is comfortable for you.
Hi everyone. It seems Allison is having some technical difficulties, so I'm just trying to get her back now. Um, so just give us a second and we will be back as soon as we can. Hi everyone, just an update. So it seems Allison has lost power at her house. Um, she is checking that out quickly and is going to let me know if she'll be able to log back in quickly or if we might have to reschedule this as a part two. But I will, oh, I just heard back from her. Um, so Allison's power has gone out in the whole neighborhood and we are going to need to reschedule the, uh, reschedule a part two of this presentation. Unfortunately, nothing anyone can do. Um, so we are going to conclude the webinar now. I believe if you attended this. Up until this point, I think you still will be able to get a CEU um, for the whole thing. Keep an eye out for information about part two. I'm sure she'll do a bit of a um, a bit of a rehash of what we already talked about, and then launch into the rest of her content. Um, but apologies again. We thank you so much for attending and. We will, uh, we will be in touch. Thanks so much. Bye.